Hi, let's start. I'm, um, I'm Dominic from uh, Polygon. Uh, I'm product manager of Polygon Maiden. And um, we are here today actually with two zero knowledge virtual machines. Most of you have probably heard of the ZK EVM. And uh, Ignazi and Jesus will uh, later talk about the ZK EVM. And um, for when it comes to virtual machine, the ZK EVM um, we should use when you want to have great usability. Um, whereas we uh, also have Maiden, uh, the product I come from, and uh, Maiden is a highly performant zero knowledge virtual machine that I want to show you today. Um, so basically, with the Maiden VM, you can write arbitrary programs on one of the fastest ZK VMs out there. Like, we have some benchmarks comparing it with uh, Risk Zero, for example. Uh, let me explain um, the goal of the Maiden VM. At the moment, our goal is that we want to build a roll-up of which the Maiden VM is the heart of, and this roll-up extends Ethereum's feature set. Whereas this, the ZK EVM scales Ethereum, obviously, so it mimics its features one-to-one, -one. and with the Maiden VM, we can build a roll-up that um, uh, it has different features than Ethereum, still secured by Ethereum. And so we want to provide and enable novel and useful applications on Ethereum using the Maiden VM. But today, only the VM. So I'm run very quickly on zero-knowledge virtual machines. Most of you probably know that, please excuse me, but some might not. So a normal virtual machine has inputs like an initial state and a program, and outputs a final state. And a zero-knowledge virtual machine, like the Maiden VM, does exactly the same. We have an initial state as an input, we call it stack, and like we have programs that we can input to um, the Maiden VM, we get a final state, plus we get a proof. We get a proof that the Maiden VM computed uh, with this initial state, that program, exactly that output, and we can add a witness, like a secret input that only the prover knows. And the verifier does not need to have access to the witness, so I can add secret data or uh, data I don't want to show to the verifier. This is a zero-knowledge virtual machine. Uh, the proof is very fast to be verified, uh, might be might take longer uh, to be produced, and uh, yeah, the witness is only known to the prover. Okay, that was a very quick rundown. But um, yeah, like compared to writing circuits, uh, our goal is that uh, the mind game, um, it should be easier to use, easier to write programs in our Turing complete language, uh, mind assembly. Um, it, yeah. That's why we want also have like the universality, so you should be able to write any program on our roll-up, also any smart contract um, that can then be proven with the Maiden VM. It should be relatively simple when it comes to the constraints, so a small set of constraints should be able to uh, uh, serve the Maiden VM. And um, obviously we also want to enable recursion, and we have a branch uh, already that uh, where you can play around with recursion. i show it to you later. Um, so when you want to use the Maiden VM, you have to write in Maiden assembly for now. And it's an, um, basically you write programs in Maiden assembly and they get compiled into something that we call the program mast. I will explain it in a second. And the program mast then gets executed on the Maiden VM. Um, so for you, uh, Maiden Assembly is a Turing complete low level language for writing instructions. So this here on the uh, bottom, you see a completely uh, valid Maiden Assembly program. It adds one to the stack, it adds two to the stack, it adds them together, and then a program ends, and this you can prove. Uh, and this program basically gets translated uh, or compiled uh, into uh, what we call a Merkleized abstract syntax tree. Um, um, or basically raw Maiden VM instructions, uh, operations. And um, yeah, and these operations then can be directly read. But I, I will show it in a second how it looks like. 
Um, yeah, so far with the theory, but because this is a workshop, I don't only want to show uh, stuff, but I want you to play around with it. So uh, if you want, you can open this uh, playground, or if it's easier on the laptop, I also have the link handy. Just switch to the link. The laptop, it might be a bit easier. Here's the link, so it's 0 xpolygonmidengithubio slash examples. And you should see something like that. Yes. Uh, you see it? Yes? OK. So this is exactly, um, yeah, this is our Maiden VM running in the browser. And I just want to show you how it works such that you can maybe hack about it or hack on it. So um, we have here um, the input files or the inputs, like what I said before, like we have the init, the, the stack init, and uh, like our witness, which is here called advice stack. Uh, we have outputs, none so far. Um, and we have the code, like exactly the code that I showed you before, right? So we have one and two being pushed to our stack-based uh, system here, and then we add the two top elements of the stack. So let's check it out. When I run it, I get three. This is the uh, stack that I get back, right? Okay, so then I can uh, prove it. So it proves in 300 milliseconds. I also get three and something which is called an overflow address, which I will explain later. Uh, but then, uh, so now there is a proof. Let's look at the proof. Okay, it's not very helpful, but it is super large, right? But this is the proof, how it looks like. Um, okay. And this, now I can verify. As simple as that. And I would love to ask you to do the same. Can you, uh, like, here select another program? One second. Can you execute the example program? Does it work? With whom does it work? Yeah? Nice. Can you prove and verify the computation of the 1,200th one one Fibonacci number? There's an example program called Fibonacci. And see if you can prove and verify the computation and outputs of the 1,200th. Does it work? Nice. That's cool. And can you look? for the program, like the Collards sequence program. And maybe at a breakpoint, right before the while loop starts, and try to go with the debugger exactly to that breakpoint. I think it's just right breakpoint as a minor assembly instruction. Thanks. I can also show you. Maybe it works anyway because you're, does it, who, with whom does it work? The debugger? I just also do it here, then you can see. So we have this Collets program, which looks like this. And I can add a breakpoint by writing breakpoint. And then it's a bit too big. I can click the debugger. Whoop. <laughs> it starts the debugger. And I can basically fast forward to the breakpoint, which would be here you see I'm now at the breakpoint, the assembly instruction at clock cycle 11. 
Does it work for you? Yeah, nice, cool. Um, yeah, like maybe one other concept is the concept about clock cycles in the VM, but maybe you know that already. This is how we measure, no? Like this is how we measure how expensive a program is. Like the smaller the clock cycle or the trace length uh, um, uh, of the program, the better it is to prove it. Like the faster it goes or less resources we need. Um, cool, so this is our playground, but I also want to show you our CLI. Um, and maybe this I just show you. Um, but you can basically um, clone the mine repo and I will send the links later. Um, um, so, and here again we can, so here I have the Fibonacci program which I can show you. So, in Maiden assembly, one second, like this here, so it's hard to show code. And this is our uh, Maiden assembly, basically how we can uh, compute the Fibonacci number. And you've seen that before, right, when you calculated the 1,200 Fibonacci number. Um, and using it in the CLI, basically, um, looks like this. And I can, uh, so I, yeah, this is the executable here. And I uh, give the command, so I say prove it, please. Um, my Maiden assembly file and then it proves quite quickly, and this is now the 1,000th Fibonacci number. Um, and I can also, here I have um, the debugger, so instead of proof, I now say debug, one second, I just make it way bigger. And, um, Um, so, okay, one second, reading program file, fail to compile program source, cannot be an empty string, ah, because I deleted the program, also good. Okay, now, <clears throat> here we can also have a debugger, uh, like, um, and you don't need to know Rust, like the mind VM is written in Rust, but uh, you can, with the simple debugger and these input files, you can just um, also create a Maiden program and prove it. And here you can also have like different commands. Next always steps another clock cycle. I can again add breakpoints and go exactly to that. Um, or I can do like show where the memory is, uh, like and whatever you need to debug. And also please provide feedback if uh, there's something missing that you need to debug that we don't show here. And um, yeah, what I also wanted to show you is our newest feature, uh, recursive verification. And um, recursive verification that we um, need, especially in the blockchain case, to compress um, many proofs um, is yeah, something that we just built. And what it actually is, is um, when you recursively verify something, then you um, prove that you verify a proof correctly, right? So, and uh, like we have the verifier that basically, uh, when we think of this playground, when we click verify, then we send there the proof, the outputs and the inputs, and the verifier gives us a one or a true um, if everything is correct. And like I can also run this verifier within the Maiden VM and create a proof for it. And this then is request verification. Most of you probably know that. Um, so, uh, but it's quite complicated to build. And um, so I want to show you the program basically. So we had uh, this initial program, like um, we repeat 32 times that we swap uh, that we swap a one and add it, so it adds. Yeah, okay. And um, and then uh, like this, like the outputs and the proof of this program basically, together with the inputs, are then the inputs of my recursive verification proof. And um, this basically of my recursive verification program, and this program actually is super small. It just looks like this. 
and I can run it. And I will show to you. Always good to show live demos. Um, let's check. It takes quite a long time, so it's around 2 to the power of 22 cycles, I guess. Try to push it under, but uh, yeah. Here it is. A recursive verification proof. That you can also hack on. Uh, I know. Who of you already, or who of you is considering hacking on the Mine VM? Maybe we can talk about bounties. Everyone already has a hack, or you don't, you don't hack at all? Yeah, we'd like to hear about bounties. Nice. <laughs> so, incentivize. Um, well, <laughs> our challenge, you get, uh, you could get $2,500 if you build an awesome application using the Maiden VM. <laughs> so, and an awesome application could be an incomplete information game like uh, Stratego or ZK Mafia. Um, but it could also be something in the realm of DeFi, so a private order book, auction, um, or um, something that makes the world a better place, or whatever you can come up with. Um, that would be really cool, like more applications. And uh, a little bit easier maybe might be to help us to improve the Maiden standard library. Like for these Maiden assembly programs, we have a standard library and uh, that you can simply import, that you don't need to write every, uh, uh, everything from scratch. And there are still some things missing, so elliptic curve cryptography, for example, could be a cool project, floating point arithmetic, um, yeah, or decoding, encoding, RLP strings, which we will need when we will build our rollup to Ethereum. Are there any questions to that? Yes? How large is the stack in memory? The stack in memory? Uh, like the initial stack, like or the stack in theory can be very big. The initial stack is bound to 16 uh, elements, but you have the advice provider where you can uh, add like um, Mer like Merkle stores and sparse Merkle trees. So lots of data uh, compressed in form of a Merkle tree. Um, yeah, and but the like this would be the the witness like the secret input where you can add. Lots of data I can show you, maybe. Uh, like here you see, like this is the initial um, input, the stack input, which is bound to 16. Um, but here you see a whole Merkle store and sparse Merkle tree, like still a small one with only two leaves uh, for, uh, that you can add. But it can be as big as, I don't know if there's a bound, is there a bound? Sparse Merkle tree size? No. 64. 64, 64 leaves. Okay. So the, the stack is technically essentially unlimited. It's bounded by the length of the trace. Um, and we have kind of a, a special design for handling overflow past the 16 elements using multi set checks. So you can let it get as deep as you would need it to be. Okay. And happy to talk more about the design after the two. Any more questions? I think we are exactly at 20. So now, uh, our colleagues from the ZK EVM. Uh, you can just click. Okay, I think so. okay. perfect. Thanks. So, hi everybody, I'm Jesus. I'm working on the Polygon ZK EVM project. And what I want to explain is the ZK ROM, that it's the assembly language that we use to build the ZK EVM. So the ZK ROM is an assembly-like language, like uh, we see like now in Maiden, uh, that, the, that would define the program for our ZK, ZK state machine. Basically, it works with resistors uh, that here you can see a bunch of them. 
and it also can use the build defined state machines. So what I'm going to explain a little bit is a, a quick over, bueno, a high overview on how it works and how you can interact in an easy model, and then, bueno, Ignacy will continue the, with a little demo or a little explanation. Thank you. So um, the Ziggy ROM, uh, basically, uh, you can interact with it with the registers. The registers are, are defined with uh, every register has eight slots. Every slot is an element of the Goldilocks field. And basically, uh, this register is what we use to basically like uh, do most of the operations or interact with the pill state machines that you will see later. <clears throat> As you see, we have the generic registers that it will be A, B, C, D, and E. And also we have like a special registers, like it will be like the state root that also has eight fields, eight Goldilocks element fields. And another registers to do like very tricky special operations, but with this to start, I think it's more than enough. And since we are doing a ZKVM, uh, we build the ZK ROM and the tooling of the ZK ROM to be friendly with the EVM. So, for example, to perform 256 operations, which is the field that the EVM works, uh, basically we divide these numbers in, in eight chunks of 32 bits. That's why we have eight slot, eight slot for every register. And then we can, we can do the operations. So now I will, I will start to the basic operation that you can do with the registers. Basically what we can do, what you can do with the register is assign it a value. So here we have an example that I want to assign at 1000 to the A. What we are doing here is like first we assign 1000 to what we call OP. The OP is an intermediate register that we use like for do operations that you will see a lot. So you have to take in mind like the, the left side of the way of the, of a line of an assembly is always assigning the OP. So in this case, we assign 1000 to the OP, and then we put an arrow to the A. So this basically means that the, in the next step of the operation, the A, we take the value of the OP, that in this case is 1000. So basically, we are assigning 1000 to A, but I want to explain it all the flow, because then you will understand more things. Uh, also, you can, you can define bigger numbers, like a, a more, more than a Goldilocks field, if you put an N, and then, well, the compiler will understand that it's a big number, and you can like uh, fulfill all the all this equation, right? In the A761, well, all the uh, all the slots of the um, register. Okay. The second thing that you can do with the register is sum. Basically, uh, you can sum, for example, A plus B, and assign the result to the C. Uh, in this case, as you see, when you sum two registers, in fact, what you are doing is like suing like individually every like uh, slot of these registers. So the OP0 will be equal to B0 plus A0 and, and so on. Uh, take a, you have a take care that every of these registers can overflow or underflow, and it always will overflow and underflow in the Goldilocks prime field. So you have to take in account this to, to do your operations. And in this case, because we put the arrow, we are, we are saying that the, in the next step, the C will take the value of the OP that it will be the result of this sum. Um, yeah, and basically you can do the same with the subtraction, it was the same way. I will go to the multiplication. So in this language, you cannot multiply two registers like uh, A multiplied by A, but you can do it with a constant. Basically, if you multiply uh, a register by, uh, for a constant, you are multiplying for the slots. And one more time, you have uh, underflow and uh, overflow in every single slot, so you must take in account that. And there is things that you can do. You can like uh, uh, add and subtract and multiply in the same line of assembly multiple registers. But what you cannot do is like multiply. Uh, yes, <laughs> multiply by a constant. Sorry, multiple registers. But you cannot multiply two registers by each other, or you cannot use more than one constant for line in assembly. For example, a multiply two plus b multiply seven. You cannot do this. So I try to put the restrictions here that you can do and what you cannot do. And well, I will pass this slide quickly. What I will just show you is like the typical registers that we use to perform the, the most common operations, but we also uh, have defined a one slot register that uh, it's just one Goldilocks prime that we use for very specific operations, maybe for interacting with some real estate machine or to keep track some, to, to some value. For example, we have a, the ZK contest, we have a register that uh, basically, for example, counts how many 
uh, binaries of how many keycaps we use in this execution, uh, and we use this number to like uh, to make a safer execution. You will see more late on this later, but basically, uh, uh, there are like uh, the, let's say special registers to keep track of um, the very specific operations. Okay. What you can do also is define labels. Basically, to define a label, you have to put a name and two points. And basically, this, this is good for readiness of the code. And also, you can use it as a jump uh, destination. Uh, you have a jump instruction, instruction that you can jump to uh, some labels and also some conditions that you will see. OK. OK. We have also variables. Uh, basically, the variables is, is used by the memory state machine that I will show later. And basically, there are two types of variables, are the global ones and the context one. The global ones can be accessed always and read it always. And the context one, it depends on one of the uh, special registers that I said before that is called context. Basically, this helps us to uh, separate uh, memory regions. And this is very useful, for example, when you are working with the EBM, because every time you do a call to a contract, you open a new context with a new variables. So you can, you can use this to like, separate completely the memory regions and, and work with that. And this is an example of defining a global variable, which could be the chain ID that this does not change in all the execution. Or for example, the destination address that can change in the middle of the execution. It's very common to use it as a context variable. OK. Now I will explain how to use the state machines. Um, basically, what we see from now is like uh, basically using the registers. And with the, with the ZK ROM, you can not uh, use the registers, but also use the PIL state machines that you, you can define before. And basically, we define state machines to work with the ABM. So for example, we define a binary state machine that basically it's prepared to work with 256 bits to do like the, the like most common operations, like adding, subtracting, doing operations, and, and stuff. And basically, it is like more useful than what you were see before, because, for example, in the example, we can see that uh, you, we, can, we can add A, A, and B. And we will add this number in the whole 256 56 bits. So uh, this operation will not underflow in the Goldilocks prime, but in the 256 uh, bits uh, that will do it also in the EVM. So let's say we, we, we do a steam machine to do like the arithmetic operations that you could do it in the EVM in a more friendly manner. Uh, OK, to use the steam machines, you, can, you must always use the same registers. In this case, for the binary steam machine, we always use the A and B. So in order to use it, you basically have to define a number in the A, where we assign a number in the A, then we assign another number to the B, and then we add the number and assign the result to the C. OK, uh, now I will explain, basically, uh, using the same binary, there is something that we call carry. And basically, a carry appears when you do a comparison, or you, are, uh, you do a comparison and your comparison is true. For example, you put an equal, and the both registers are, to, are equal, so you have a carry, and also when you have like a, when you do an additional subtraction and you have overflow and underflow respectively, so you can handle this type of uh, th uh, this type of operations with uh, jump C. Jump C is a special operation that basically checks the carry of the state machine in the same line, and in this case, jump C is like jump carry. So if there is carry, uh, does the action that in this case is jumping. So this code that you see here, uh, basically I compare two numbers that are equal, and if they are equal, that it's the case, we will jump to a label that it's called read code. It's like a very common operation. Okay, that's good enough. Okay, and one another steam machine that we use a lot is like the memory one. Basically, what we allow us to do is like load and store uh, things, uh, to load and store register values. Basically, uh, it does not need any register in particular like the binary that it needs the A and the B. Basically, it just needs like a variable uh, that, we did, that I explained before what, what they are. And basically, you can store values and load values using the, like, the same variable as you see in the, in the example. And then the last steam machine that we'll explain is Adif. These steam machines that I explained are, are the, let's say, like the most common ones. And to have an overview, we have more. For example, we have a Kikak steam machine, we have a Poseidon steam machine, and so on. Uh, you can check in the cheat sheet. I think if more or less you understand the, 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 the behavior of these ones, 
and that you have to use always the same registers and what is the OP, you will, like the other ones are more or less straightforward. But if you have any questions, you can always ask us for sure. Okay, the RTST machines, basically we use it to, to verify multiplications because as you see, since now we, don't, we do not have anything to verify multiplications. So we, basically the RTST machine, it always verifies that the resistor I multiplied by the resistor B, B uh, plus the C is equal to 200, <laughs> to a, I said, it's equal basically to the overflow of the operation plus the OP. So how to use this? I have an example code here, basically we define the A, B, and C, and D, and at the end you call the array to the result. Uh, as you see, there is a, like a, another operation that I didn't explain that it's like in, in this case. Basically what we can define here is like executor functions. You can call a JavaScript like uh, an arbitrary function or basically uh, operations as you see here, like basically multiplications, exponentiations, whatever you want. This is like a free input, like an input that an executor puts directly. And the idea of this operation is like, you like pre-calculate the multiplication of the two numbers and then you verify them using the array testing machine. So I hope this uh, gives, us, give, gives you a, a little bit of overview on how we use our ZK ROM and now Ignacio will continue with an, an example. Thank you so much. Do you have any questions? Yes, I'll put my laptop. Okay, first of all, um, <coughs> my name is Ignasi. I work at the CKBM team at Polygon with, with Jesus. I'm going to explain briefly what's the workshop about. Um, well, first of all, the bounty, it's like a, a 5,000 matics that will be split in the 10 best proposals of optimization of the code of the ZK ROM or the smart contracts. From the smart contract side, I think that more or less most of the people know about the gas consumption, so we are talking about um, gas optimization. But uh, about the ZK ROM, probably it's something more new, so now I'm going to focus uh, to, uh, to explain a little bit about um, the ROM optimizations and how does it work and how we measure the performance of the ZK ROM. And I'll give you some, some examples uh, about how to, to measure this. First of all, how we measure the performance of the ZK ROM. Well, well this, this repository here, there's a readme with everything that I'm going to explain now, uh, explain it step by step, and this, if you really want to participate in this workshop, you should definitely look at it. Um, to find it, well, you just have to search for my name on GitHub, and the repository is called ZK Hack Islam. So how we measure the performance of the ZK ROM, of a part of the code of the ZK ROM. To do this, we use a metric called counters. And what are counters? When we create a batch of transactions that have to be processed by an executor, uh, this executor has a limited resources. The executor is the, like, the service that runs the complete code of the ZK ROM. This, um, these resources are measured with one metric that we call counters. There are different kind of counters that they are spent when you do certain operations of the ZK ROM, some of the operations that Jesus has explained. For example, there's a counter called binaries that is spent when you do a binary operation. Or um, there's another one called keycacks that is spent when you do a, um, a keycack operation, a hash key digest. So, what I'm going to show now is just um, some example about how can I uh, measure the performance in counters of a part of the code of the ZK ROM. To do this, I will do a very simple example with the opcode of at. In, in this readme, at, at the bottom, you will see some useful links that will definitely help you to, to do this workshop. One of them, which actually I've used a lot in my day-to-day -day work, it's the evm.codes. 
First of all, uh, let's check what the add opcode does. Most of you probably already know, but this is a very simple opcode of the Ethereum virtual machine that what it does is the addition of two 56-bit integers that are in the stack, and it outputs the, the addition. So let's see how is this logic, how is this reflected in ZK assembly, in the ZK ROM. Okay, so this is the code of the add operation. First of all, we have to check if we have enough counters to do this operation. To do this, we check, first of all, the steps. The steps is one of the counters. Um, each line of code execution, it spends one step, and the other one are the binaries. The binaries is the one I said about that it's spent when you do, for example, an add operation. We can see the add operation here at the bottom. Bigger, yes. Okay. So after checking the steps, we do another check with this, the stack underflow. We need to have at least two numbers in the stack before doing this operation, because this operation will waste, will spend two, two positions. So in case we don't have two numbers on the stack, the stack pointer is pointing to the current size of the stack, we have to go to uh, the stack underflow logic. Another check, as this is an Ethereum virtual machine, we have to check if we have enough gas to perform this opcode. This is done here. Gas is a registry where, where we store the current gas of the execution. And this, this level, gas fastest step, that has a percent at the beginning, it means that is a constant. You can check the values of the constants in the constant file. And the check gas, uh, gas fastest step has a value of three. Because three is the cost of the opcode add. So we put this, um, the deduction of the gas faster step to the gas to A. And then we put, we update the gas registry with the A value. And in this jump N, means jump negative, this checks that gas is not negative so that we have enough gas to continue with the execution, else we will jump to the out of gas. Finally, well, not finally, but we go to the, um, to retrieve the values of the stack to do the operation. We put on A the value at the top of the stack and on B the, the, the value just before the top one. And finally, now yes, we do the addition operation. And we store this operation result to the stack. And we jump to the next opcode execution, which is this logic. It's done in the in the read code function. Okay. <clears throat> so, an example of optimization here that I've put on purpose would be an optimization of steps. Here in the check out of gas. We are, do, you are, we are using two steps because we are using two execution lines to do this logic. But it could be done directly um, setting the result of this operation directly to the registry of gas and then jumping. And we can do it just this way. This way, you don't, we don't need the, the following line. And we are doing the, exactly the same logic, but just with one step less. But going back, let me show you how to know how much steps is we are using for this opcode. We have some tests here in the folder counters for each one of the opcodes. Well, there are some missing, but most of them. And the op add, this is a test. I'm not going to go deep in the logic of the test, but you can use them with, everything this is split in the Rini, but just to, to show it here. We have a script 
that's also in the counters folder called counters executor .javascript, where you can run a test, a unit test of an opcode and see the output. The output will be the number of counters that are used for this step, for this opcode. So if I run, want to run the code of the op at, I just run this, this script and it outputs me how many steps, uh, how many, sorry, how many counters um, I've, I've spent to do this, this logic, which is one binary and 15 steps. With the optimization I did before, if I run the script again, you see now that the number of steps has been reduced by one. This could be considered like a possible ROM optimization. It's just to give you an overall idea of some propositions that you can submit for, for this workshop. You have the code of the CK ROM available to check for optimization, <coughs> as simple like this one, or some more complex optimization. As I said, you have everything here in the, in the readme of this repository. Also, there's a brief explanation of every one of the, of the counters that can be optimized. There's also an example of how to put logs in the ROM in case you want to, uh, well, I think if I can put, just to show it. You can put here, for example, if you want to know the value of A, a log, and when you run the test, you will see at the top the value of A, which is two, on a scalar, zero, two on X. And last, well, to submit it, it's explained here, but it's doing a, it's, you have to do a PR to the repository with your proposal, and this will be reviewed by us. Here you have some useful links about um, the audit reports we had recently in the different repositories and also the audit of the smart contracts. And here you have also, if you want to go for the optimization of the smart contracts, you have the repository of the solidity code of, of the bridge. And finally, I, I wanted also to mention, ah, this, this one. <laughs> Um, in case you, I mean, this is like very easy for you, we are also open and we uh, encourage you to, if you find some vulnerability issues in the code of the ROM or in the smart contracts, you can apply to Immunify, which we have a position in there where you can earn up to $1 million if you find a critical, a critical bug, but there's also medium bugs with uh, low earnings, but also very interesting. And well, we encourage you to do, to do this if you, well, if you find yourself like you can find some possible bug about it. So that will be everything from my side and from Maiden and, and CKBM and hope you, you participate on our, on our challenges. We are waiting for you. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, just uh, now it's the moment. Oh, sure. <laughs> Maybe later if you want, sorry. What, the? Yes, the name of the person. Okay, so that's all. Thank you very much.